Professor Todd Garth. I teach Spanish and the languages in the culture department here. I'm going to keep this introduction very short. But I do have a quick story. About five years ago, I had the immense privilege of speaking on a panel with Edith Grossman, the eminent translator of Latin American and Spanish literature. And I mentioned this to my brother and sister-in-law, who at the time who lived in New York, when I was going to be on this panel. And my sister-in-law insisted on attending. And I said to my sister-in-law, Odella, you know me. You know that what I have to say in this panel is going to be completely abstruse, scholarly, boring. Don't bother me. To which my sister-in-law replied, well, I don't care about you. I want to see Edith Grossman. <laughs> Well, my now ex sister law. <laughs> you see what happens when we come to your knees? <laughs> Actually, she's, we still talk. <laughs> my ex sister law is she's an avid reader, but she's not a scholar. She's a tenant's rights lawyer. So think about it. How many translators do you know of that have achieved the kind of star status that has lawyers after your name? I think Dr. Lewis can tell you. I think, and I would agree, not nearly as many as those who deserve it. But it's a measure of her extraordinary talent that Edith Grossman has risen above the overwhelming neglect and abuse of translators to achieve this kind of fame. It's a fame well earned. When you open one of Dr. Grossman's translations, you are opening the best self. Uh, not only because the novels of Garcia Marquez, Margar Chosa, and Carlos Fuentes, and Cervantes are best-sellers in their own right, which of course they are, that's part of it, but Edith Grossman crafts translations of these works that become best-sellers in the English-speaking world because of her talent and her mastery of a rare and largely misunderstood art. She is in her own right a literary giant. So please keep this in mind while we listen to what she has to say to us, and please give her a warm big welcome. Well, you leave me blushing, Todd. Uh, I always think those kinds of introductions should come after you've heard me, not before, and then you can decide whether to believe a single syllable of what's been said. Um, so I want to ask your forgiveness because I'm going to read this paper. It was written very recently, and I have not completely internalized it yet. So. I have to read it, but I will look up at you from time to time in an effort to make eye contact. Um, I'll move my glasses so I can see you and try to communicate with you non-verbally as well as verbally. Uh, today I would like to discuss the exceptional importance that literature and translation can have for a good number of writers all over the world who are frequently indebted to foreign authors whose work they have mined for nuggets of insight and revelation. Writers generally learn from other writers the lessons they need to know about stylistic and thematic devices or narrative and structural techniques. Long before the advent and popularity of university MFA programs in creative writing, Young artists tended to learn their craft by working as literal or figurative apprentices to older, more experienced practitioners of the art. In our day, even graduates of MFA programs are likely to read other authors for that kind of instruction. But even if they can read only their own language, literary translation affords them the opportunity to find their mentors anywhere in the world. Cormac McCarthy is quoted as saying, quote, the ugly fact is books are made out of books. The novel depends for its life on the novels that have been written. And that's uh, July 6, 2014 in the New York Times Book Review. If translation were in need of any further defense and justification, it definitely is it is desperately in need of fostering, but that's a subject for another day. 
it would be important to acknowledge that access to a substantial body of translated literature broadens and deepens the field of possible guides for countless writers. I plan to focus on an essential line of multicultural, I hate that word, but I'll say it, multicultural, multilingual influence acquired by means of translated books that runs from Miguel de Cervantes to William Faulkner to Gabriel Garcia Marquez. But first, I'd like to clarify a crucial point. I don't intend the word influence to serve as a synonym for imitation. On the contrary, for me, it suggests a source of inspiration, an almost serendipitous encounter with a solution, even before the problem has been fully articulated, when it is still an unformulated quandary. An excellent example of this phenomenon is found in Garcia Marquez's memoir, Living to Tell the Tale, when he recalls his initial reading of James Joyce's Ulysses, a book in translation he was first introduced to by a friend who told him with the authority of a bishop, as Garcia Marquez put it, with the authority of a bishop, this is the other Bible. At first he, dis he Garcia Marquez, dismissed the book reading it, as he says, in bits and pieces and fits and starts until I lost all patience. It was premature brashness. Then Garcia Marquez tells us, years later, as a docile adult, you know, people throw James Joyce aside only when they're young. And you, you get to, to re reach a certain age and you never throw him away. Um, I set myself the task of reading it again in a serious way. And it not only was a discovery of a genuine world that I never suspected inside me, but it also provided invaluable technical help uh, to me in freeing language and in handling time and structures in my books. Before I turn to that essential line of influence I mentioned a little while ago, and since I'm talking about the importance of translated works in uh, um, the development of literatures in a variety of cultures, I'm going to go off the topic a little bit. It's my prerogative to go off the topic. I'll get back to the topic in another page. Um, before I turn to that essential line of influence I mentioned a little while ago, I'd like to direct your attention to two other instances of the relevance of translated literature. These examples are not intrinsically connected to our main topic, but I find them too fascinating to overlook. On first looking into Chapman's Homer is a stunning example of the impact that reading a work in translation can have on a receptive writer. The image of John Keats reading an Elizabethan translation of Homer, then confusing Cortez with Balboa to the befuddlement of countless generations of schoolchildren, and finally writing an exquisite poem about the experience is a wonderfully strange example of the impact that translation can have. Chapman's, poem, uh, Chapman's Homer is the only poem I know of that exalts a translated work because it did precisely what it was supposed to do. It opened the gates to a classic epic poem and to another civilization for a reader who did not have the linguistic key that fit those locks. And now, my second example that's off topic, but not really off topic. A far too rapid glance at Petrarch, an indispensable name in this savagely abridged account of translations that have profoundly affected the work of other writers. Having perfected and refined the sonnet that was first introduced into Italian in the 13th century, Petrarch's merging of this rigorous poetic form in the 14th century with the systematized courtly concepts that first came out of Provence and then defined the idea of love for modern Europe created the backdrop for some of our greatest Western lyrics. At one point, a long time ago, all the writers influenced by Petrarch probably knew Italian. Apparently, Chaucer did. 
he was one of the people influenced by Petrarch. But there came a moment when they probably didn't. And still his work continued to resonate throughout Europe and then the Americas. Wyatt, Garcilaso, Ronsard, Quevedo, Dunn, Shakespeare, Hopkins, Baudelaire, Auden, Frost, Yeats, and countless other poets who lived after him all owe a huge debt to Petrarch and the sonnet, his great poetic gift to the Western world, though he himself was disdainful of what he called the lyrical trifles that he composed in the vernacular. Uh, because like most other people at the time, he thought the only serious language was Latin. Finally, we come to the point, to Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, the indisputable creator of a modern literary language and a modern literary genre whose influence is so profound and so widespread that attempting to track it in a complete and thorough way would take more time than any of us has, any of us have at our disposal. But I'll give you a thimble-sized synopsis. You know I was going to do that, right? It's too complicated, but I'll tell you about it anyway. Part one of Don Quixote was published in 1605, part two in 1615. Translations into other European languages followed very quickly, considering that this happened in the early 17th century. The first of them was Thomas Shelton's 1612 English translation of part one. His translation of part two appeared in 1621. Are you keeping track of the date? You have the date? 1605, 1615 for the two parts of the Quixote in Spanish. Shelton came in with the first translation of Quixote in 1612 and then in 1621 he did part two and it meant that English speakers had the complete novel only a few years after Spanish speakers did. And Shelton is a hero of translation. Um, Ensuing contemporary versions included the French, 1614, the Italian, 1622, and the German, 1621, though it was incomplete and not actually published until 1648. Following Shelton's translation, the story of Don Quixote in the English-speaking world is varied, constant, and profound. It very well may have begun before 1616 the year both Cervantes and Shakespeare died. You know, they, were, they died in the same day. But England and Spain were on different calendars, so it's not the same date. I think there's a seven-day difference. Um, and I am incapable of remembering which country was on the Gregorian and which country was on the Julian calendar. So you can check it on your magic phone and find out. I, I, I don't remember. Um, it may have, be, have begun before 1616 with the tortuous saga of a play called Cardenio, or the history of Cardenio, long considered lost. Uh, Cardenio, by the way, have, has anybody read Don Quixote in the world? Yes. Uh, uh, Cardenio is the hero of one of what's called the interpolated tales in the first part. Um, it's a fairly long short story. Um, long considered lost, the recent news items, this was all over the New York Times, contained unsubstantiated reports of a manuscript of the play discovered in the effects of a deceased English lord whose very existence has been called into question. It, it's like something out of Downton Abbey. Um, the drama, presumably written by Shakespeare and a man named Fletcher, his collaborator, was based on one of the interpolated tales in part, see I'm repeating myself, I'm sorry, but that means you'll remember it, right? Uh, in part one, a story that recounts the trials and travails of a wealthy young gentleman driven mad by love. Cardenio's lovesickness proves to be a kind of contemporary, that is mid-Renaissance, ironic mirror image of Don Quixote's literary and somehow willful faux medieval madness. 
if you read the Quixote, you'll realize that his madness comes out of the books that he's read, which is why I call it a literary madness. And in a sense, he wills himself into the world that is no longer there. He wills himself into the world of the Middle Ages, uh, which had ended 200 years before uh, the action of the novel takes place. If we skip to the 18th, now I'm taking you very quickly through history. So if we skip to the 18th century, we encounter the widely celebrated influence of Cervantes' Don Quixote, often acknowledged by the authors themselves in their books on the development of the early English novel, notably Henry Fielding's Joseph Andrews and Lawrence Stern's Tristram Shandy. Tobias Smollett, who wrote satirical picaresque novels in imitation of Spanish models, did I say that right? Novels in imitation of Spanish models, went so far as to publish an English version of Don Quixote in 1755, which has become a classic in the history of translation. These books and other like, others like them were the fertile soil that nourished the great flowering of European and American prose fiction in the 19th century and its continuing expansion in the 20th and 21st. There are well-known connections between Cervantes and Gustave Flaubert in Madame Bovary, Cervantes and Mark Twain in Huckleberry Finn, Cervantes and Fyodor Dostoevsky in The Idiot but I'll pass over those intriguing relationships and race headlong into the 20th century to consider the thematic and stylistic impact of Don Quixote on the writing of William Faulkner, arguably the foreign novelist with the greatest influence on 20th century Latin American literature. He has even been called, even been called the best known Latin American author writing in English. Faulkner often said that Don Quixote was one of the novels he returned to over and over again, claiming he usually read it once a year. Uh, I mentioned that to Carlos Fuentes one day, and he said, Sir, why? I read it once a year. I said, really? How do you have the time to write anything and read Don Quixote once a year? Because it's a thousand pages. You know, it's not a short book. But you should never question uh, an author who claims to read Quixote once a year. Um, his home library, that's William Faulkner's home library, contains three editions of the novel in translation, as well as a bust of Don Quixote. Critics and commentators have found a family resemblance between the failed idealists in Faulkner's novels, those damaged, genteel people attempting to hold on to their dream of a mythic South's traditional agricultural society in the face of a contemporary rampaging urban capitalism, and Don Quixote, who feels compelled to revive and reestablish in the modern world of 16th century Spain his anomalous literary vision of a chivalry that never was, that never existed in history. Although Cervantes alludes to historical knights in the novel, the Spanish crown's renowned crusaders and conquerors, Quixote's most significant and revered models are fictional warriors like Amadis of Gaul and other exemplary heroes of the chivalric novels. Uh, the, chivalric, the novels of chivalry were the most popular form of reading in the 16th century all over Europe. Everybody read novels of chivalry. Saint Teresa of Avila read novels of chivalry. And uh, they were adventure stories. They were stories about knights doing impossible things, uh, encountering dragons, uh, traveling through space and time from adventure to adventure. Um, and this is the literature that drove Quixote mad because he wanted to be a knight like those knights. Um, to oversimplify this important point, for the deluded characters of both Faulkner and Cervantes, historical reality has become irrelevant. For them, 
only fictional reality matters, which means a reality that is the product of purposeful invention. Faulkner seems to have been co consistently intrigued by the figure of the failed Manchegan knight. For example, in an interview he gave at, may I say it, West Point uh, uh, many years ago, he said, quote, it's admiration and pity and, amaz and amusement. That's what I get from him, and the, him being Don Quixote. And the reason is that he is a man trying to do the best he can in this ramshackle universe he's compelled to live in. He has ideals which by the pharisaical uh, standards are nonsensical. I discovered that word only when reading this citation. Pharisaical means worthy of the Pharisees. Um, his method of trying to put them into practice is tragic and comic. But more important, I think, than the similar personality traits and dashed hopes of Cervantian and Faulknerian literary characters is the spell cast over the American's writing by the convolutions and meanders of the Spanish Baroque style. Cervantes' language, though typically filled with long, complex sentences, that accumulate subordinate clauses and wind their leisurely way to the end of the paragraph was perfectly straightforward and direct compared to that of many other 17th century authors. But it seems that Faulkner could not resist the allure of circumlocution in spite of Cervantes' relative simplicity. In fact, his style was once described as Dixie Gongorism. Uh, Dixie because you know he was from Mississippi. And Gongorism, uh, Gongora being the early 17th century Spanish poet responsible for the solitudes, almost 2,000 lines of the most difficult and complex poetry ever written in any language. And I know because I took on the glorious quixotic task of translating that gorgeous poem a couple of years ago. I, when I finished translating that, I said, I can do anything. <laughs> no matter what they ask me to do, I will be able to do it. Um, I find it fascinating that Faulkner's new world absorption of a decidedly florid, circuitous, and ornate style is at odds with a characteristic, deep-rooted tendency toward directness in syntax and simplicity in diction that has been dominant in English for several centuries. This preference for concision and clarity probably reached its unqualified literary zenith in the writing of Ernest Hemingway, who shared with William Faulkner a mid-20th century position of novelistic preeminence, though they were at opposite ends of the stylistic spectrum. It seems to me that Faulkner's English language version of a 17th century style may very well be what Latin Americans found so attractive in his writing. The Baroque, particularly in the person of Cervantes, is there like a subliminal drumbeat at the back of every Spanish language writer's mind. And for this reason, the circumlocutions of Faulkner probably seemed familiar, almost classic to Spanish language writers and readers. Would you like me to say that again? Yeah, let me say it again, because I, I think if I make any point at all in this paper, that may be the most important one. The Baroque, that is to say the Baroque, it's 16th and 17th century, late 17th century, moving into the 18th century. The Baroque, particularly in the person of Cervantes, is there like a subliminal drumbeat at the back of every Spanish language writer's mind. And for this reason, the circumlocutions of Faulkner probably seem familiar, almost classic, to Spanish language readers and writers. In an attempt to demonstrate this point, I'd like to read for you a portion of Quixote's first words to Cardenio Remember, Cardenio is the one that they think Shakespeare wanted to write a play about. 
um, when the two men finally meet in the Sierra Morena. Cardenio, in his madness, is living rough in the mountains, wearing the tatters of his once fine clothes, sleeping outdoors, surviving on the charity of shepherds, goat herds, and whatever he can pilfer or scavenge. He has moments of lucidity, however, and is perfectly rational during the first part of this encounter. The fairly substantial paragraph contains only four sentences. Uh, it goes on like this much of a page, and there are only four sentences in it. You'll hear, you'll hear how the sentences go on and on and on. Um, You have to wait a minute because I lost my place. Hang on. Okay, here we are. He has um, the fairly substantial paragraph contains only four sentences. I'll follow that with an excerpt from Faulkner's The Sound and the Fury, a three sentence paragraph that began as an entry in the index he added to the novel for the portable Faulkner and which was then used in later editions as an author's foreword, a publication history that is Baroque in every way. So you got it, it started out as an entry in the index and it became part of the foreword. So here's Don Quixote and Cardenio. They exchange formal and rather formulaic courtesies with Cardenio telling the pseudo knight that his only desire is to reciprocate Quixote's kindness. Quote, and mine, responded Don Quixote, is to serve you. Indeed, I had resolved not to leave these mountains until I had found you and learned from you of your sorrow, which your strange way of life indicates you are suffering, might have some kind of remedy. And if it did, to seek it with the greatest possible diligence. If your misfortune were one that had all doors closed to any sort of consolation, I intended to help you weep and lament to the best of my ability. For it is still a consolation in affliction to find someone who mourns with you. And if my good intentions deserve to be thanked with some courtesy, I entreat you, Senor, for the sake of the great courtesy I see in you. And I implore you for the sake of the thing you have loved or do love most in this life to tell me who you are and the reason that has compelled you to live and die in this desolate place like a wild animal. For you dwell among the beasts estranged from your true self as demonstrated by your dress and your person. And I swear, Don Quixote added, by the order of chivalry which I have received, though unworthy and a sinner, and by the profession of knight errantry that if, senor, you satisfy me in this, I shall serve with the devotion to which I am obliged by being the man I am, whether to remedy your misfortune, if it has remedy, or to help you lament it, as I have promised you I would. And here's the first entry. Okay, so that's Cervantes in translation. Uh, here's the first entry in the appendix, which is actually the foreword of the sound and the fury. Ike motube, that's I-K-K-E-M-O-T-U-B-B-E. Ike motube, a dispossessed American king, called Lom and sometimes de Lom by his foster brother, a chevalier of France, who had he not been born too late, could have been among the brightest in that glittering galaxy of knightly blackguards who were Napoleon's marshals, who thus translated the Chickasaw title, meaning the man, which translation Ikamotube, himself a man of wit and imagination, as well as a shrewd judge of character, including his own, carried one step further and anglicized it to doom who uh, you get from de l'homme to doom, who granted out of his vast lost domain a solid square mile of virgin North Mississippi dirt as truly angled as the four corners of a card table top, 
forested then because these were the old days before 1833 when the stars fell and Jefferson, Mississippi was one long rambling one-story mud chink log building housing the Chickasaw agent and his trading post store. To the grandson of a Scottish refugee who had lost his own birthright by casting his lot with a king who himself had been dispossessed. This impartial return for the right to proceed in peace by whatever means he and his people saw fit, a foot or a horse, provided they were Chickasaw horses, to the wild western land presently to be called Oklahoma, not knowing then about the oil. Isn't that remarkable? There are almost no commas, in, there, there's almost no punctuation in that, um, those few sentences. There is a notable difference between the Cervantian paragraph and the Faulknerian. Cervantes's writing is elaborate and embellished, but it follows a logical, coherent, and linear narrative sequence. Each statement follows from the previous one. Don Quixote may have been mad, but his derangement never interfered with his ability to speak cogently. Faulkner, on the other hand, does not even attempt a straightforward or linear telling of a tale. He isn't interested in progressive sequencing. His account creates a kind of spiral that disavows the rectilinear for the circular, the chronological for a sinuous movement through and around time and space, as each reference seems to acquire at least one explanatory ancillary phrase. This was a lesson that Garcia Marquez took to heart and held close for his whole life, extending the notion of narrative circularity past the kind of material contained in a single passage, as in the paragraph just cited, and applying it to the structure of entire books. Not even his works of nonfiction, such as News of a Kidnapping or Living to Tell the Tale, are organized chronologically. If you read Garcia Marquez carefully, you will find that he speaks in circles. He speaks in a spiral. The narrative voice speaks in a spiral. And each time you pass a point along that spiral, it, you pass it with more information than you had the first time you came around, which makes for a very interesting narrative style. Garcia Marquez always acknowledged the immense influence that Faulkner had on his writing. In the speech he gave when accepting the Nobel Prize in Literature, he called Faulkner his maestro, his master and teacher. His memoir, Living to Tell the Tale, opens with an evocation of the boat trip he took with his mother through a swamp to the town of Aracataca to sell his grandparents' house. During the trip, his primary occupations seem to have been chain smoking and rereading Light in August in Spanish translation. As he describes the uncomfortable, mosquito plagued overnight voyage, he mentions the importance Faulkner had for him, calling him, quote, the most faithful of my tutelary demons. Faulknerian spiraling though more evident in the narrative structure of Garcia Marquez's novels than in particular passages, can be glimpsed in the following excerpt from The General in His Labyrinth. It is part of a compelling evocation of the liaison between the liberator, Simon Bolivar, and Manuela Saenz, his mistress for nearly 10 years, and the woman who fearlessly saved his life when assassins stormed into their bedroom one rainy night in an attempt to kill him. The essential point made in these pages is that science remained faithful and loyal even though Bolivar repeatedly abandoned her, if not for another woman, then for the irresistible call of the war for independence. And this is the passage from the general in this labyrinth. Early the following year, he left her again to complete the liberation of Peru, which was the final enterprise of his dream. Manuela waited four months, 
but she set sail for Lima as soon as letters began to arrive that not only were written by Juan Jose Santana, the general's private secretary, which was not unusual, but were thought and felt by him as well. That's a great, that's a great line. She found him in the pleasure palace of La Magdalena, invested with dictatorial powers by the Congress and besieged by the beautiful, bold women of the new Republican court. The presidential palace, uh, that is to say the Magdalena, was so disorderly that a colonel of the Lancers had moved out one midnight because the agonies of love in the bedrooms did not let him sleep. But Manuela was now in territory she knew all too well. She had been born in Quito, the illegitimate, illegitimate daughter of a wealthy American landowner and a married man. And at the age of 18, she had jumped out the window of the convent where she was a student and run off with an officer in the king's army. Nevertheless, two years later, she was married in Lima and with a virgin's orange blossoms to Dr. James Thorne, a complacent physician who was twice her age. And therefore, when she returned to Peru in pursuit of the love of her life, she did not need lessons from anyone on how to hold her own in the midst of a scandal. Okay. In recount, the recounting is circuitous, but the language and sentence structure are fairly conventional. This may be due to a moderating effect of the eminently rational Cervantian style on prose in Spanish, in spite of the Faulknerian influence. How odd to think that the work of the Baroque writer in Spanish is more pellucid and more straightforward than that of the 20th century author in English. That kind of convolution is comparable to the somewhat winding path of influences between languages that we have been following, Cervantes to Faulkner to Garcia Marquez, and then on to contemporary English language novelists whom we haven't mentioned before, but who are certainly the Colombians' legitimate heirs and include Toni Morrison and Salman Rushdie. I'd like to conclude by going back to the Faulkner Latin American connection. thirsty business reading to a room full of people. Garcia Marquez is not the only writer who has acknowledged Faulkner's huge impact on his artistic development. So have Carlos Fuentes, Mario Vargas Llosa, and other members of what is called the boom generation, who have made Fal boom generation, that's the group of writers in Latin America who came to promise prominence in the early 1960s. Who have, because they, and, and they're called boom because they made so much noise when they appeared on the scene. Um, who have made Faulkner's complexity and circularity their own. One of the links among them is surely the Cervantes connection. But I believe there is something else as well, something exclusively American. Just as Faulkner and Garcia Marquez each created a semi-mythic place, Yokna Patofa County and Macondo, as the setting for many of their stories, they and their colleagues employed a circuitous style in what I believe was an attempt to overcome the great linguistic problem of temporality. Unlike music and its wonderful ability to, make, to say many things at the same time in chords. Literature, because it is language, is obliged to speak sequentially and say only one thing at a time. We have become so accustomed to that linearity in language that we are hardly even aware of the limitation. But consider this, these writers were intent on recreating in their novels a kind of new world geology of their respective societies, which certainly differed from one another, but had something uniquely American in common. They were multi-layered, and in all the Americas, South, Central, North, Caribbean, those layers were comparable. 
They consisted of an indigenous population who were forcibly repressed and sometimes eradicated, African slaves who were forcibly imported and brutalized, and European settlers who forcibly made themselves masters of everyone and everything occupying the top stratum. But the layers were not rigidly separated, even when legally segregated, and they were never impermeable. Their ongoing interpenetration and commingling, however unwilling, however fraught with crisis and calamity, could perhaps have been expressed most adequately in a chord, a music not of the spheres, but of the Western Hemisphere. But since writers are not composers, they have to settle for creating language whose complexity and circularity can seem to say several things at once and evoke multiplicity. Perhaps this is the bridge that spans the apparent differences between South and farther South, between Mississippi and Colombia, Colombia and Mexico, Mexico and Peru. Perhaps the bridge that allowed Cervantes to influence Faulkner and Faulkner to influence Garcia Marquez could only have been constructed through the medium of translation. Perhaps translation is literature's approximation of a chord. Thank you very much. Um, we'll have a little Q&A. Yeah, yeah, we have some time for questions. Sure. Uh, yes, ma'am. Then how difficult was it for Faulkner to be translated into Spanish and staying true to its original? Uh, uh, translation is always difficult. And if it's a good translation, it is true to the original. So I don't think it was any more difficult to translate Faulkner into Spanish than to translate Garcia Marquez into English. It's very hard. It's not for the, uh, the weak-willed. Uh, it's for the lunatics who think they can do it. Um, but it's no more difficult to go from language A to B than it is to go from language X to Y. I couldn't answer that question. I don't know, but he was, he was certainly available in the 1940s. Uh, when did he die? In, in the 60s? Yeah, so, you know, his stuff was available in Spanish, and uh, particularly coming out of Argentina, which was a center of, of, of publication, a publishing center in, in Latin America. Yes, sir? Well, each language is a unique system, and it has a unique history. Um, I don't know if I could uh, go down a laundry list of differences between English and Spanish. I can tell you some of the things that are very difficult to bring over into English, if that's what you're interested in. Uh, the difference between, do you all know Spanish, a little bit of Spanish? The difference between tu and usted, uh, we don't have that. We used to have thou in English, but that dropped out of the language 400 years ago, unless you're a Quaker. And s <laughs> some old fashioned Quakers still use the and thou, but um, generally that's gone from English. Uh, it's a very important difference in Spanish. Uh, there are, it, each word has you know, hosts of meanings, you, you know, whether you call someone tu or you call someone usted. Uh, very difficult to um, get that difference. Um, because Spanish is a Romance language, uh, well, no, let me say it differently. Sp uh, Spanish is a Romance language, and like the other Romance languages, it has no apostrophe S. Yes. 
So you can only show a an ownership with um, a prepositional phrase. That means it takes longer to say something in Spanish than in English. English is a very tight um, language, which is what makes Faulkner such an unusual writer in English. Uh, Hemingway is much more uh, uh, typical of the genius of, of English. Um, so a book, I, I've had a, a book, or a, let's see how many pages, uh, 425 pages in Spanish and it has 350 pages in English. And somebody says, what did you cut out? I said, I cut nothing out. But it takes less time to say certain things in English, um, fewer words than Spanish. Um, I can't think of anything else right standing here. Uh, yes, ma'am. I love it. I love it. I, first of all, I hate the word Spanglish because that seems very disrespectful to me. Uh, I live in New York and listening, riding the subway and listening to some Spanish speaking people is like living on the frontiers of the Roman Empire and listening to the development of brand new languages that are not Latin and not Celtic and not whatever the indigenous languages were that the Romans conquered, uh, in the territories that the Romans conquered. Um, my favorite mixing of the two languages happened, I was in a supermarket one day and a whole shelf of canned goods had had the wrong price stamped on them. So all of the stock guys, I don't, stock boy is what you say, but these were grown men, so I can't call them stock boys. So the people who took care of the shelves were all talking, and they sounded Mexican to me, and, and they were talking in Spanish. And one said, I don't know anything about it. You have to talk to the noche man. <laughs> and I said, the noche man? It sounds, what a great detective story that would make, you know, the, the coming of the noche man. It was very scary. Um, I mean, that is so delicious a, a, a phrase that um, I don't know how anybody can be upset by it. Um, what's the other one I like? Dame on break. You, you hear that, you hear that on the trains a lot. And uh, tomalo easy, which, which I'm also very fond of. So this is a whole other way of talking about your experience. And uh, you know, the more ways we have, the better off we are, I think. Yes, ma'am. Oh, you were really listening, weren't you? <laughs> Multicultural, it sounds so academic. It sounds so, it sounds so artificial to me as if we were coming from a place where everybody was exactly the same and spoke exactly the same language and had exactly the same experiences. And then if you have people with different experiences, you have to invent a word to describe it. I mean, I don't know where anywhere in the world where only one people live with only one language and one experience. So maybe we have to talk about unicultural and forget about multicultural because the whole world is multicultural. So I dislike it for political reasons. So on that note, um, first of all, I have to apologize for the temperature and freezing you out. I had no idea. No, no, it's, it's, it's very good. It kept me on my toes. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely kept me on my toes as well. Um, I wanted to present you with a photo album. Oh, thank you. And we'll give you a chance to give a little bit of a tour.
Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you.